So let's do this this morning. I would like to speak to you concerning the early ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. I, Susan put up the beginning. There's a reason for that. Luke chapter 4 is where we want to go. Okay. Luke chapter number 4, please. All right. Luke chapter 4. Let's notice verse number 16. And I'm going to read down to verse 16. Okay. Chapter 4, verse 16, read down to 21 is what we're going to do. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on a Sabbath and stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And he opened the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of the sight to the blind and to set free those who are oppressed to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down and the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be with your saints. I pray now you'd bless uh, this simple message and the principles we find within it. Might it bless us, and as Dan spoke about earlier, might, might we reach out, not in domination, but in love and kindness uh, to those around us and show them exactly who our Lord Jesus Christ is. And we'll thank you for that in Christ's name, and amen. Uh, if you notice chapter 4, verse number 1, all right, back up to verse number 1, if you would. It says, Now Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was being led around by the Spirit in the wilderness. Now, this, this happens after the baptism of our Lord, during the... Um, ministry of John the Baptist. Now, if you'll remember this, and I'm going to slide this in here. Uh, last year sometime, Brother Dan Kramer did a message for us saying how the Lord's ministry was only one year long. Okay? And I, I've since looked at that. But what I discovered w was this, that our Lord's first year of ministering, okay, which, which we'll see here, actually was the same time John the Baptist was ministering. Now, what was John's job? Anybody remember? He was, he was to prepare the way of the Lord. So the Lord's ministry, okay, was kind of subdued during the time frame of John the Baptist. And not until John was taken to prison and ultimately killed, okay, then the Lord comes forth. And that's what we're going to see right here, right? He went into the desert. There's probably a year gap here between the temptation of Jesus and his ministry. Notice verse 14. And Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. Now he went full of the Spirit, <laughs> okay, and was led by the Spirit there in verse number one. But now he returns to Galilee. Now where is Nazareth found? where he grew up, in Galilee. If you have a Bible map in the, in the back of your Bible, you can look there and you see all the towns, Capernaum and other places, Nain, okay, uh, that we've mentioned uh, recently. So he returns to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him, okay, spread through the surrounding district. And he was teaching in the synagogues, being praised by all. So here we have the Lord is returning, okay, from the first year and returning. Now, Dan's thought was this, that when you go through the scripture here, you see only one uh, Passover celebrated, celebrated by the Lord. And then the last Passover has to do with he goes to Jerusalem for his death. And he's not there for the Passover. On what day did the Lord die? The day of preparation, all right, of the Passover. So... 
we see that and that's how Dan numbered his, his, his years there, as you see it, which to me is, was, was very eye-opening. But as we look at this now, okay, he's full of the Spirit in verse 1, but he's got the power of the Spirit now. In other words, John is off the scene. Actually, he'll be off the scene in chapter 7, okay? But he's, he's coming in power because where is he going? He's going to Galilee where he grew up. He's going to Zat Nazareth, which was his hometown, if you please with me, okay? So it's kind of like a homecoming that we see in verses 14 all the way down through verse number 30, okay? Now follow this with me if, if you can. Uh, let's pick it up again in verse number 16. And I'm going to read one more time, 16 through 18. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And he was, as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. Now, prior to this, in verse 15, and he was teaching in their synagogues, being praised by all. So the Lord was in Galilee, visiting different places in Galilee, and going to the synagogues. Now, where did the synagogues begin? Does anybody know? Captivity. In captivity in Babylon. And the reason they, they started uh, synagogues, because they didn't have a temple. Now, the rule the Jews laid out was this. There had been at least 10 men to have a synagogue. Of course, the ladies came too, but 10 men for a synagogue. So the synagogues came back with the Jews to Judea, okay, to see that. But what came with, this, with the uh, synagogues? What came back? Who came back? Pharisees, scribes, all right? You don't read about them in the Old Testament. They're the ones that, that gave their lives to, to the Word of God, okay? But the problem is they added to it also. So the Lord goes to these places to be a blessing to them, okay? To show them what's, what's going on as, as, as you look at this. Now, here's what happened when, when someone came into the synagogue. And you can read this in Acts uh, with the Apostle Paul. Because he was asked one time to speak, all right? And, and he did that. But generally what happened in the synagogue was this. They had a reading out of the law, first of all. Then they had a reading out of the prophets, second. Then they had a reading out of the writings. Now the writings would be Job, Psalms, Proverbs, etc. It's even uh, Daniel is considered one of the, uh, one of the writings and, and not a prophet there, okay? And so you'd have three different gentlemen that would stand and read a portion. Now, what's interesting about this one, in verse 17, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Now, remember, a scroll wasn't a book like you have in your hand. A scroll, what do you, they're rolled up, okay? Now, watch what it says here, okay? And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the scroll and found the place. Now, what's that give you the idea of? He knew what he was looking for, and he unrolled the scroll till he got to that particular place. In other words, the attendant there in the synagogue didn't choose what Jesus was going to read. Jesus himself did that. Okay, y'all with me so far? Okay, good. As, as we see this. So when we get to verse 18, okay, what do we find? Well, let's go to Isaiah 61. Keep your hand here. I'm, I'll, I'll be right back. Come to Isaiah 61, because that's where he goes to read from, okay? Isaiah 61. Now, where is he? Keep this in mind. What's where? In his hometown, all right? His hometown is where he was. So when we get to verse, 60, uh, verse 1 in chapter 61 of uh, Isaiah, it says this, The Spirit of the Lord Yahweh is upon me. Because Yahweh has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim release to captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of Yahweh. Now, when you look back in Luke chapter number 4 uh, and verse 19, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord, but that is not the end, okay, in Isaiah 61. It continues on. But that has to do with the coming judgment and such. 
All right, you follow me there? And, and, and so the Lord stops here, the favorable year of the Lord. Now, I wonder what the favorable year of the Lord was. So Dan says Jubilee. It could be. Uh, recently, I just, we spoke and we saw that the Lord stood over, you know, after he entered Jerusalem, went to the temple, then went by himself. He stood over Jerusalem, spoke, you know, you get the idea. He's speaking to the city. And his heart is broken. And he says, you've missed and haven't seen the what? The visitation of the Lord. They had no idea of who he was and why he had come. I mean, it's one of the saddest things you're ever going to see, you know, as you read the scriptures. So this favorable time of the Lord has to do with something with the presence of the Messiah, because Isaiah 61 is a messianic song. So when he, come on back to Luke with me, all right? Luke chapter 4. So when he reads this, we see the ministry of the Messiah. All right? He's going to preach the gospel. He's going to re, uh, proclaim release. He's going to give sight to the blind. And when you read that, you study that, and I look at the Jewish, my Jewish study Bible and other references I have, it doesn't have anything to do with making a people see physically. It had to do with their spiritual eyesight. Because Israel missed that. Okay? Freedom from sin. And then, watch this as we read, uh, where are we? Chapter 4. Notice verse number 20. Okay? As you look at this. And it says this. And he closed the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. All right? And the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. Why? Stop for, use your imagination. Why do you think that, you know, he gave, here's the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, he went and sat down, and everybody's looking. There's more. It's Either why he read it or what he read it. Okay. Well, you know, they, they want to hear more. Why did he read this? It's a messianic psalm. Okay? So they're waiting. And remember what it said up in verse uh, 15. He was visiting these other synagogues. And, he, and some of these towns had more than one synagogue. Visiting them. And he was praised because of what he was teaching. Now he comes to his hometown. Okay, to his hometown, and notice what it says here in verse number 21. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture, what scripture? Isaiah 61, has been fulfilled in your. So, this proclamation of the favorable year of the Lord is now fulfilled. The presence of God is with them. And the word became flesh and dwelled among us. He was a manifestation of God in the flesh among the Jewish folks. Okay? Now, now just, just think about that. So, what did he just do? He just equated himself with the messianic psalm, which means he's telling these people in his hometown, I am the Messiah. <laughs> now watch what it says, verse 22. And all were speaking well of him and marveling as at the gracious words which were coming forth from his lips. And they were saying, now watch, they were marveling, gracious words. But watch what they say. Is this not Joseph's son? The Messiah doesn't come from Joseph. So what are they doing? They're questioning, having doubts on what he just said, even though it was gracious, okay? And so when you, when you see this today, the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. But is this not Joseph's son? 
The Messiah was to come from the family of David. David was born where? Bethlehem. That was his town. Bethlehem. So that's where the Messiah was to come from. Well, where was Jesus born? And most people didn't know that. All they knew is he came from Nazareth. In fact, who was it Philip or Nathaniel? Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? You know, if you remember that, when the Lord called him there in John. So as you look at these things, Jesus is claiming to be the suffering servant. Now that's who the Messiah is. Okay? Therefore, he's claiming not just Isaiah 61, but he's claiming Isaiah 53, because that's also a messianic psalm. So come on back there with me. Okay? And watch what we have. So these, these Jewish folks, okay, are questioning him. Man, it's now the favorable time of the Lord. Right now. See? And they've missed it, is what it amounts to, as you look at this. But watch what happens here. And <laughs> I'm going to read uh, the psalm here, okay? Because he's, he's claiming something here about himself. The psalm, the, the prophet Isaiah, I'm, I'm sorry. Notice what it says here in verse 1. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of Yahweh been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of a parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hid their faces. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely our grief he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Remember, this is a prophet saying what he's heard from God, Isaiah, concerning who the Messiah is going to be. He was crushed for our iniquities. I wonder where that came from. Remember Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15? All right. The chastising of our peace fell upon him, and by his words we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to his own way. But Yahweh has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter, like a sheep that is silent before its shears. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that, that he was cut off out of the land of the living, that for the transgression of my people, striking was due to him or due him. So his grave was assigned with wicked men. Yet he was with a rich man in death, his death, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. But Yahweh was pleased to crush him, second time that word is used, putting him to grief, if you would uh, place his soul as a guilt offering. He will see his seed, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of Yahweh will succeed in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, and he will bear their iniquities. Second time that's told us. Therefore, I will divide for him a portion with the many, and he will divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sins of many and interceded for the transgressors. Now that's a, that's a lot of stuff there, isn't it? Okay, a lot of it. 700 years before the Lord shows up, this is prophesied by Isaiah. Okay, 
prophesied by Isaiah. So we just read Isaiah 53. How much of it did you get into yourself? <laughs> now watch. Let me give you an abbreviated list of what happened to the suffering servant. All right? You don't have to look at your Bible. I mean, this comes right out of Isaiah 53. He was a root out of dry ground. What does that mean? They were dead spiritually. They had been divorced by God. We saw last week, Jeremiah. Okay? They were dead. When they rebuilt the temple that Ezekiel talked about, rebuilt that temple, did God come back to it? No, he didn't. Why is that? Their time was already over. Their time was already over. The kingdom of God has nothing to do with the flesh. In fact, what did Jesus say when the Pharisees asked them about it? He says, it's already with you. It comes without observation. Nobody's going to see the kingdom of God. It's within you. People today still can't grab a hold of that. People today are still waiting for the kingdom of God. Now watch what else we have. There's no majesty, no beauty. He's despised. He's rejected. He's overcome with sorrow. He knows sorrow by experience, by the way. Not just in his sufferings in that last week, but during the course of his ministry. Men had hid their faces from him. All right? It's like when he walked down the street, people turned their back. We don't need to know him. He was not esteemed, but he bore our griefs, carried our sorrows. He was stricken. He was smitten by God himself. He was pierced for our sins, crushed for our rebellion, chastised because of us. He was wounded. He carried our iniquities. We talked about iniquity last week, if you remember that. Where is iniquity? In every person that walks on the face of this earth. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. He did not complain. He was judged. He, he was cut off from the land of the living. He was murdered, sealed in a grave, put to grief, suffered an anguished soul, it talks about. He poured out his soul to death. He numbered, he was numbered with sinners, although he was sinless. Before he poured the sin of us all, and yet he's still making intercession for men today. So what is the meaning of all this, Brother Dan? At the cross, Jesus took upon himself all the evil that rightly belonged to us. That's what he did and in exchange gave us all the good that rightly belong to him. An inconceivable exchange, I would call it. One of my favorite movies, I hate to interject a movie here, is The Princess Bride. Remember the little guy that was with the, the big guy in the sword fighter? What was his favorite saying? Inconceivable. He just couldn't believe it. It makes no sense at all that the God of heaven would do that for mankind. But he did. Let me give you an example of this. Get it into your mind. It would be like walking into a bank with more debt than you could pay back in a hundred lifetimes and handing the bank manager all your bills, all your collection notices, all your late fleet fees, all the repossessions, all your bankruptcies, all your foreclosures, and laying them all on his desk. And what does the manager do? He opens the door, drawer to his desk, pulls out a key, and gives the man the key to the bank. 
it's all yours. The riches of the bank. That's exactly what God did with us. He took it all. And remember this, Yahweh, we say God the Father, was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. It wasn't that he divorced himself and watched it all from the heavens. No, he was here with him, okay, as you see this. So God does this for whom? Us, for mankind. Watch a few verses with me. Come back to 1 John. You say, Brother Dan, I thought we were talking about Luke 4. We're, we're going to get back there. Okay, uh, 1 John chapter 4, please. And wa watch this. Verse number 9 and 10 say this. By this, the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, so that we might live through him. Why did he send Jesus into the world? That we might what? That we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. A satisfaction, a covering for our sins. That's why he sent him. That we might live through him. Y'all got that? Come back to Romans. I have four verses here. Five verses. Okay. Watch what we have here. Romans chapter number five, please. Okay. Romans chapter number five. Very common verse. Verse number eight. But God demonstrate his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, what happened? Christ died for us. Notice verse number 10. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his what? And whose life are we to live by? According to 1 John chapter 4. His life. Okay? Then I slide back to John chapter 17. Our Lord is praying here <laughs> to his father. This is before he goes to the cross. And notice verse number 26. And I have made known, or I have, I have made your name known to them. And I will make it known so that the love with which you love me may be where? May be in them and I in them. That same love that God had for his son, Jesus wants us to have it. Saying, hey, and I'm going to be in them. I mean, that's amazing when you think about it. Okay? And here's Jesus coming to his hometown and going right to 60, uh, Isaiah 61, uh, a Messianic Psalm, which is connected with 53, which they knew, and declaring these things to them. Luke chapter 19, verse number 10, he came to seek and save that which was... Now watch Hebrews 12 with me. Okay? Hebrews chapter 12. I find it amazing in my Christian life, which is almost 50 years old now, okay, that we can believe these sort of things, but we can't believe anything else God says. Honest. God said it, we don't believe it. Watch verse number 1 and 2 here of chapter 12. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, i got to tell you a story. Last Yesterday evening, last night, my wife went to bed, her and the puppy. And so I'm, I'm left out in the living room, and I have my phone. So I, I went to YouTube, and I'm listening to uh, I Can Only Imagine. I just love that song. And I listened to the clips that came out of the movie, I Can Only Imagine. They had different clips coming out of it, okay? And, of course, in the movie, uh, forget the, the girl's name, they gave her the, the song. And, uh, and she couldn't sing it, so she had the kid to come up and sing it. 
You remember the movie if you saw it, okay? And it became the number one song in American Christian music. I can only imagine, you know, that sort of thing. So I, I went down and I heard the kid uh, that wrote the song sing it with his, his group. Do you know they, they uh, wrote a sequel to that just this last January? He has seven people in his band that sing, play instruments and all that. And he gave the testimony of seven people in his band, plus him, that's eight people. They all had within two month period of time, somebody die that was close to them. A grandparent, a parent, a nephew, a brother, a sister. It was kind of sad to listen to that. And so what he did, he wrote a song concerning that and how the joy is going to be when they're reunited, you know, back together again is, is, is what we're saying. Back together. And I think of that when I read so great a cloud of witnesses. People have gone before us, experienced the life of Christ, okay, as you see that. And they're surrounding us, it says. So the surrounding is those of, I believe, chapter 11. They live their life, and they are witnesses to whoever reads about them, right? So then it says this, laying aside every weight and the sin which so easily entangles us, let us run with endurance the race that is set where? Before us. And by whose life are we to be living? So it's not something you have to do by yourself. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of what? Who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I mean, that's wonderful thinking. It brings to my mind Colossians chapter 3. Set your affections where? That's where Christ is. Okay, as you see that. One more verse. Come over to 2 Corinthians chapter number 2. Okay. 2 Corinthians chapter, I'm sorry, number 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And let's notice verse number 21. He made him who knew no sin be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now, personally, I believe that the sin they're talking about there, sin lieth at the door, God told Cain. Y'all remember that? Chapter 4 of Genesis. I believe that Abel brought a lamb for Cain, a lamb offering. He only brought his vegetables, and God didn't accept them. Okay? So Jesus was the sacrifice here. All right? The sacrifice, so that we might become the what? Righteousness of God in him. Now, think about all these things we just said out of Isaiah 53, 50, or 61, 53, and, 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 and the verses, all right? And here's Jesus. Now, think about this. He's in his hometown. They invite him to, the, he goes to the synagogue. They invite him to speak out of the scroll. He finds a place he wants. He, he shows them, I am the Messiah. And what's the first thing out of their mouths? Isn't he the son of Joseph? They just denied it. Okay, he's a carpenter's son. Now come on back to Luke 4, if you would. Okay, please. Luke number 4. Luke 4. I'll be there in a second. Here we are. Luke 4. Okay, now watch what happens here, and I'm going to read down here, make, make some comments so you understand what, what's happening. Okay, is, in verse 22, the end, is this not Joseph's son? Question mark. And he said to them, no doubt you will quote this proverb to me. What's the proverb? Physician, heal yourself. Now, why do you say, hey, 
you're going to quote that proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. What's that mean? Well, where has he been prior to this? He's been in Galilee. He's been through these synagogues. He's been doing what? Healing people. Helping people. Ministering. Although it's, it's not on a, the biggest stage, because John is still there. Okay? But he's doing this. So, undoubtedly, you're going to say to me, physician, heal yourself. Now, let, let, let's read the rest. Whatever we heard took place at Capernaum, do also here in your hometown as well. What did they want? They didn't want to hear words. They wanted to see the flesh. And that's what Christianity wants. Flesh, flesh, flesh. Heal us. Show us a sign. So Paul writes later on to folks, what? Jews require a sign. They won't believe without a sign. It's one of the saddest things in the world. Here, God himself in the flesh of Jesus Christ comes down to this earth, walks among them, is love manifested, and they can't see it. Not at all. Why couldn't they see it? We deserve a kingdom. We deserve to be out from under Roman rule and Greek society. We deserve to have a temple that we can worship at. That's what they were looking for. Because they misread the covenants of the Old Testament. We read the covenant of God gave to Abraham, and God said, you're going to be a blessing. Your family's going to be a blessing to all the families of what? But when you read the Old Testament, what do you read? They hated the Gentiles. And when you read Hebrews chapter 11, was Abraham looking for land? No. He was looking for a city whose builder and maker was God, a heavenly spiritual city. I mean, we, we could go on, but this is what was going on through the minds of the Judeans at that time, okay? And as a result of that, what happened? They missed the visitation of God, okay? Missed the visitation of God. Let me read down, okay? And now he's going to watch. He understands this. So now he's going to get under their, their skin, okay? As you, as you look at, okay? So, he says this in verse 24. Truly I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. Whoa! Isn't this Joseph's son? Can't be a prophet. He's just Joseph's son. Just a carpenter, right? But I say to you in truth, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the sky was shut up for three years, and six months, when a great famine came over all the land. And yet Elijah was sent to none of them. None of whom? None of the Israelites. But only to uh, Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha, the prophet. And none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. What do we know about this dear lady and Naaman? They were Gentiles. And all the people in the synagogue were filled with what? Wrath and rage. Man, they were praising him earlier as they heard these things. And they stood up and drove him out of the city and led him to the edge of a hill on which their city had been built in order to throw him down the what? Throw him down the cliff. That was their desire. Now you think about Isaiah 53. And the prophecy concerning the Messiah. Anything about rebuilding the city? Of getting rid of the Romans? No. 
None of it. Okay? But watch what happens in verse 30. But passing through their mind, their midst, he went on his way. And here's what happened. He came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. So he just continued his what? His ministry. He went to Capernaum. Capernaum becomes his new hometown. Okay? And they were amazed at his teaching, for his message was with what? Authority. Y'all see that? His message was with authority. So you say, Brother Dan, what's this all about here? Okay? As, as, as you look at this. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This is to the Jews. Okay? And what did they do with it? They rejected it. Okay? They rejected it. It's a sad, sad situation. But what does the Lord do? He keeps pushing on. And he's going to have many other things that happened to him just like happened here. But he's going to that cross for a purpose. Okay? For a purpose. That's to bring mankind to the place that God wants them to be. Is that physical or spiritual? Come on, talk to me. It's spiritual. Okay? God is spirit. They that worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. And who did he tell that to? The woman at the well who was a half-breed Samaritan Jew. Okay? You can't, you, you can't miss it as you go through the scripture. But yet Christianity has. We want to attach Jesus to physical this, physical that. What kind of body are you going to have when you leave your present body? Is that important? What Rose says, what's it look like? <laughs> Second Corinthians 5 says you live in a tent right now. And when that tent is gone, God has a tent made by his hands and not by what? The hands of men. So your mother and father had no say in that. Okay? I, listen, it's a wonderment as you read the scripture. I'm going to say this to you. It's simple. Simple. It's simple. And what have we made it? Difficult. 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 Why is that? It's the same reason Christianity today has the same problem that the Jews have. They want a sign. They want to see it. Okay? They want to see it. So, I'm going to encourage you something. Okay? Christ died for you that you might live. How? By him. That's what it needs to do. Now, I'm going to say something else. Dan here, my son, gave me a book by Mr. Ord a few years ago. And the name of the book is this, God Can't. Everybody thinks God can do everything. He can't do everything. Thomas Ord. He can't do everything. Do you think if he could get rid of evil on the face of this earth, he would have done it? Why can't he? Because God has a plan, and that plan revolves around L-O-V-E, love. He loves the sinner as well as the saint, okay? That's what it's all about. So God can't do it himself. What's he need? Someone to live through his son that can do it. I mean, wouldn't it be wonderful if God would just... Snap his fingers and everybody was. But that's not going to happen. Yes, we all have free wills. Yeah, that's the deal. So, Luke chapter 4. Now think about that story. Very simple, but Jesus 
is manifesting himself to begin his totally public ministry, and he's rejected in his hometown. No, the prophet's not accepted in his hometown, which is sad. Okay, so keep that in mind. Keep in mind this. Things in the scripture are based on a God who is spirit. And if you're going to worship him, you're going to do it in spirit and truth. Okay? And the principles of spirit are found where? In the book on your lap. So it's a wonderful thing God has done for us.